So hello, Gershon. How are you? Hi, Joe. Um, there's a question that in the Hebrew language we've removed over the past year. It's a very difficult question to answer. Um, my my regular answer to the question is, how are you, is something that I shouldn't probably say on the podcast. And why was that removed? Well, because our situation is so bad that this country is very sad and still in deep in trauma. And no one here is good. No one can answer that question and say, oh, I'm good. I can say on a personal level, you know, everything's fine. But on a national level, on a on a sense of where we are in this country, it's very bad. And how long has that been going on? Well, it, it got much less worse. It got a lot worse on October 7th of last year. Our situation wasn't good beforehand, but beforehand it was easier to separate the personal from the political, the national. After October 7th, there's no separation. We're, we're all still in deep trauma and suffering the pain and agony of this war that we've been through for more than a year now. Do you see a way out? Of course, there's always a way out because there are no military solutions to this conflict, not the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, and not even the conflict between Israel and Lebanon. There are political solutions that need to be framed. We know what they look like. They need to be based on regional cooperation. We've seen regional cooperation throughout the course of this war um, with Israel's neighbors helping to defend Israel when it was attacked by Iran. And we know that a bilateral process between the Israelis and the Palestinians is not the road to go on. We failed on that road for 30 years. We need a regional process that will include the Saudis and the Emiratis and Jordan and Egypt and the other Arab neighbors in a, in a discussion that will create an architecture for stability, security, economic development, dealing with climate change and all the rest within the framework of the existence of a state for the Palestinian people next to Israel. And I'm not yeah, talking I about saw... Jordan. I'm talking about the territories occupied by Israel in 67. I saw your announcement that you are with another Palestinian. I forgot his name. Samer Sinjalawi. I'm sorry? Samer Sinjalawi. Samer Sinjalawi are uh, now uh, advancing the idea of a two-state solution. Right. We have been working together for quite some time. We successfully brought together two former leaders, Ehud Olmert, former prime minister, and Nassau Kidwar, former Palestinian foreign minister who has great credibility and legitimacy on the streets of Palestine. And they drafted together a vision paper, which includes ending the war and the transference of governance in Gaza to a civilian um, a technocratic professional government, and did the formulation for the two-state solution based on the 67 border with exchange of territories, with a solution for Jerusalem that includes the old city, not under Israeli sovereignty or Palestinian sovereignty, but under the guardianship of five nations, including Israel and Palestine. Basically, Nasser and, and, and also Kidwen Ewald Onrit present this vision to challenge the reality that we're living in, to, to shine a light on the possibilities here. And since that vision has been presented, we've been going around with them in meeting foreign ministers in the region and in Europe around the world. Um, they published a joint op-ed piece that appeared in 33 newspapers in 15 languages all across the globe. And on the basis of the work that we started doing with them, we're advancing now a program to rapidly and intensively change Israeli and Palestinian public opinion. Because our sense is that when you speak to Israelis and Palestinians separately, they will tell you, I want peace, but I have no partner on the other side. And objectively speaking, it's true. There is no partners for peace in Israel society or Palestinian society when you look at the reality. And that's the reality that we need to change. We believe that by raising the voices of people who say, yes, I want to live in peace and I'm genuine about it. I'm willing to make the compromises necessary on both sides. We will, in, in, in addition to hopefully producing new leaders in Israel and Palestine, be able to make a, a change here. Because this war that we're fighting in Gaza now for more than a year has to be the last Israeli-Palestinian war. Uh, there is an organization called Land for All. I'm sure you are familiar with them. Yes, I'm um, a member of them. You're a member of them? Yes. Oh, and they uh, articulate um, a very similar, or if not identical, vision. Yeah, and there's no doubt there are, there are visions out there. There's nothing especially unique about the vision that Olmert and, and El Kidwa have put forward, other than that it's being led by two personalities who were in positions of power. Nassau Kidwa was the PLO ambassador in UN for 17 years. 
He was a foreign minister of the Palestinian Authority. He's the nephew of Yasser Arafat. In May of 2021, in the elections that Mahmoud Abbas canceled, he headed a list for those elections supported by Marwan Barouti. In fact, Marwan Barouti's wife, Fadwa, was number two on the list after Nasa being number one. For doing that, Mahmoud Abbas threw him out of Fatah. He was the president of the Yasser Arafat Foundation. And Nasser is now living in exile, but he's a, a leader who has a role to play in the future of Palestine. Olmert brought us closer to a deal with the Palestinians than any other leader in history. He's more courageous than any of the politician or former politician in Israel today. And perhaps he doesn't have a chance of returning to politics, but his voice is very important. So do you see the a two-state solution being accepted by the Israeli public in general and the Israeli uh, current uh, Netanyahu government? No, no, no. Any future here that includes even the word of peace does not include Netanyahu, does not include Abbas, and does not include Hamas. We need to get rid of all the leaders that we currently have, and we need new leaders here. I can't tell you who they are. I'm not going to point to anyone in particular other than I pointed to Nasser Kidwa as a potential on the Palestinian side. Within Israel, we will have new leaders. They, they were behind the protest movement for 40 weeks before the war in Gaza, and they're behind the protests that have been going on in Israel for the last seven or eight months. There are new people out there, and they will rise to power. We will see new formulations of political parties and new personalities. They will come. And the two-state solution, which you know I thought was off the agenda, I thought it was no longer a viable option, is back. It's back because the international community recognizes that it's the best way to move forward. Now, I know you, your plan that you've been working on for many years for a confederation, which I support as well. But the road to a confederation goes first through the decision to have two sovereign states that make decisions to give up pieces of their sovereignty for a wider federation or a confederation or whatever construct it's going to be, a land for war or the Joseph Avisar model for confederation. All these decisions need to be taken once Palestinians have sovereignty and independence, and they'll be able to make those decisions. And I certainly want to see a regional arrangement with open borders and cooperation that goes not only through Israel and Palestine, but to our other neighbors, who some of them we have peace with, but it's a very cold peace for a very long time. And it'll only get warmer when there's a solution for the Palestinian people. How do you propose to get rid of the current government, uh, the current leaders that are in control? Well, I'm not suggesting a coup d'etat, but we have still the remnants of a democracy in Israel. And eventually we will go to elections. Eventually this government will fall or its time will run out and we will have new elections. And it is very difficult for me to imagine that after everything that we've been through and all the failures of Netanyahu and everything that led to October 7th and everything that happened after October 7th and the failures of his government and the failures of his personality and his narcissism and his psychosis and his paranoia and every damaging thing is a danger to the people of Israel and to the state of Israel, that the people of Israel will be wise enough not to elect him again. He, he has a spike in the polls right now because of the military successes in Lebanon and killing the Khiyasmawar. But when you look at the broader picture, the coalition that he runs today is not electable. Since October 7th, the bulk of the people on the right-wing nationalist messianic Haredi people don't get a majority, even if Netanyahu is spiking right now in the polls, and I think it's temporary. But someone else will be elected, assuming that someone else will be elected. Why would they accept the formula of a 1967 border with the exchange of land? And what do you propose to do with the settlements? Right. So First of all, I, I don't know that an elected leader is going to march into negotiations with the Palestinians on a two-state solution. Um, I do know that more and more countries around the world are recognizing the state of Palestine. I think it's 151 or 152 countries now that recognize Palestine. And there will be more down the road. That doesn't end Israel's control and occupation of the Palestinian territories, but it, it signals that the veto on Palestinian statehood is being removed from Israel. By the way, there are 165 countries that recognize the state of Israel, I call for all 193 member states of the United Nations to recognize both states. If we want to fight fundamentalism and radicalism and extremism, the way to do that is by making the two-state solution real to Israelis and Palestinians. They need to see that it's genuine, that it will bring us real peace. So the way to do that, by the way, is 
you know, it's enough for one leader on one of the sides to begin speaking the language of peace to have an impact on the other side. And whether it's an Israeli leader or a Palestinian leader that does it, it will have the impact on both sides of the conflict. Now, with regard to the settlements and the settlers, an annexation of 4.4% of the West Bank, which is the maximum territory that's on the Israeli side of border that can be transferred to the state of Palestine, would accommodate about 80% of the settlers who would remain where they are under Israeli sovereignty within the annexed areas. The other 20%, which is significant because they're the more extreme, the more radical, the more fundamentalist of the settlers, have to be given a number of choices. One choice that they probably would reject is to remain where they are and live in the state of Palestine as residents of the state of Palestine, not with armed militia, but accepting the laws of the state of Palestine. Now, they probably will not accept that. They have the chance to move to the annexed areas and stay within what they call Judea and Samaria, or they have the option of being repatriated to the state of Israel. If I were in charge, I would also put out a plan that would tell those 20% of the settlers that we're going to pay you a very significant amount of money to move back either to the annexed areas or to the state of Israel. A very large amount of money. But the longer you wait to make that decision, the less money you will receive. So we need to build in incentives. And at the end of the day, that might not work also. At the end of the day, they might have to be physically removed and there might be violence and there will be spoilers. As we saw in the past, our prime minister was assassinated because he tried to make peace with the Palestinians. We have to be ready for all of that. We have to be ready for spoilers on the Palestinian side. In my estimation, about 30% of Israelis and about 30% of Palestinians will say no to any peace deal on the table, regardless of what it says. They won't even read it. They'll be against it. But a majority of 70% or more of Israelis and Palestinians would support this. And that's what's important, because we have to recognize that we are still a democracy, and the Palestinian people have an, an ambition to live in a democracy. Do you see any constellation, and, and now I'll talk about the Palestinian side, any constellation of possible Israeli government that will accept your plan? Not right now, no. Do you see any constellation of a Palestinian government that will accept your plan? God, I think that the fun, the most basic thing on the Palestinian side is that Mahmoud Abbas, who is 89 years old and is in the 19th year of a four-year term, needs to retire, or he needs to step aside and become president for life without the, the powers of governance. Um, he needs to appoint a legitimate prime minister. I remind the, the listeners that back when Arafat was alive, the U.S. government forced on Arafat to appoint a prime minister. The Palestinians didn't have a prime minister before that. They forced on Arafat the position of prime minister. They gave that job to Mahmoud Abbas, and they transferred much of Arafat's powers to Mahmoud Abbas, and that's what led to the end of the Intifada, the second Intifada. That's what needs to be done today. The Americans, the Egyptians, the Jordanians, the Saudis all need to say very politely to President Abbas, your time has come to move aside. Be president of life, have immunity, no one will prosecute you for corruption, but it's time for you to appoint a new political leader. In my view, the best political leader out there right now who's not in prison is Nasser al-Kidwa. Of course, all Palestinians or most Palestinians support Marwan Barwuti, who is in the 23rd year of five life-term sentences. We don't know if Marwan will be released in a deal with Hamas or if he won't be released. We also don't know what Marwan Barwuti really stands for today because we haven't heard from him in 22 plus years. And Nasser al-Kidwa is someone who is respected and he could do the job. Will that happen? I don't know. Are there other candidates? There likely are other candidates. The current Prime Minister of Palestine, Mohammed Mustafa, is a decent man. I know him quite well. He headed the Palestinian Investment Fund for many years. But he is not seen as legitimate on the streets of Palestine. He is seen to be in the pocket of Mahmoud Abbas, and he is not seen to be independent enough. The reforms that he has put forward, which have been embraced by the U.S. government and supported, are not going to happen as long as he doesn't have the real power, and the power remains in the hands of Mahmoud Abbas, uh, which is preventing any positive movement on the Palestinian side now. Along even, with Hamas, if, of course. even if there are, um, on the Palestinian and the Israeli side, theoretical governments that will agree to this plan, is this plan going to end or, or, or begin with substantial violence on both sides. I think we've seen the most substantial violence in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that we've ever seen in 76 years. 
it's hard to imagine that it could get worse than it is currently. We would have to move into a peace process, a genuine peace process based on the region with the support of our regional neighbors and support of the United States and the European Union. But now not another American-led peace process because the Americans really don't know how to do it. And they tried for 30 years and they didn't succeed. And it shouldn't be bilateral Israeli-Palestinian, as I said. But another thing that we have to learn from the past is that a new, renewed peace process has to really start with foundation stones such as dealing with education. If you want to understand any country, any society, look at what they teach their kids. And when we look at the educational system in Israel and in Palestine, we don't kids teach our kids to live in peace. We don't teach our kids about the other side. There's no question that the Palestinian educational system is a lot worse than the Israeli system in terms of teaching hatred. But the Israeli curriculum and textbooks don't teach peace. They don't teach about Palestinians. Israelis and Palestinians need to learn each other's languages in a way that they can speak them. This should be mandatory from grade one. Israelis should be learning Arabic. Palestinians should be learning Hebrew from grade one. And we need for each side to agree on criteria to look at their educational system and for each side to come up with the, with the proposals that it will put on the table to change that curriculum. If that happens, then we have a completely different foundation on which to build a new peace process. Because then it's an acceptance of a whole new set of values, which are the values that sanctify life and don't sanctify death. It's legitimate for us to have our narratives and for us to look back in history at all the horrible things that they did to us. And both sides have that. But we need a new generation of leaders who are also going to have one eye looking forward to what needs to be, not only what has been. So why are you not proposing a one state for everyone? Well, I think the, one reality, government? the reality more than ever before, certainly after October 7th of last year, is that these two people cannot live in one state. We've been killing each other for more than 100 years over a territorial expression of our identity. Each side, the Jewish people and the Palestinian people, want a piece of land that they can call their own. They claim that they give their identity to the land and they take their identity from the land and they're both talking about the same piece of land. So it's unreasonable to think that you can move from the most horrible war, the trauma that we're going through, the Jewish people living through the worst trauma since the Holocaust and the Palestinian people living the worst trauma since the Nakba of 1948, that suddenly they can come to live together in one state in the United States of Israel-Palestine. That's not what Israelis and Palestinians want. They want a land that's theirs. They want a land where they could express their identity. They want a land where their culture is dominant, where their language is dominant. So there is no one-state solution. Is a one-state preclude the, the Israelis or the Palestinians from having their identity? I think it does, because between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea today, there are 7 million Palestinian Arabs and 7 million Israeli Jews. What do you do? What's the identity of the state? What's the culture of the state? What's the language of the state? How do you do it? I don't think that we can move from where we are to that reality overnight. Maybe those people who want a one-state reality, the way to get there is through two states that function side by side in peace and have open borders and trade and commerce and educational exchanges and, and people get to know each other. Maybe someday in the future they'll decide Let's remove our borders and let's create one new flag that represents all of us. I think it's very unlikely. But uh, if you want to get there, that's the way to do it. There are plenty of countries in the world that have different um, cultural, different uh, uh, language and different uh, identities, but they live together in peace. Right. Why can't I, it be done in Israel-Palestine? I don't think we're ready for it. I think we been traumatized too much by each other. We've killed each other too much. We have too much history and too much religion here. It's not just about a national identity. It's also about religious identity and it's about culture. It's, it's not really a war between Islam and Judaism, but Islam and Judaism play a very large role in this conflict and we can't remove it. And these are very deep set beliefs that you, you can move to France and become a French citizen you can't move to Israel and just become part of the Jewish nation. Other Arabs perhaps can move to Palestine and become Palestinians. I don't know. I think it's difficult because Palestinians have their own identity and their own subculture within the broader Arab culture. Um, it's true that Palestinians have moved to other Arab countries and have become citizens of those countries, but part of their Palestinian identity always remains with them. What is the ideology of a Jewish state? I don't know. For me, I want Israel to be the nation state of the Jewish people and all of its citizens. I'm part 
one of the founders of a political party that was registered two years ago called All of Its Citizens. And we take our name from the Israeli Declaration of Independence, which guarantees that the state of Israel will grant full equality to all of its citizens. And this is how I think the state of Israel needs to be. I wish, sorry, I would be very happy to see a complete separation between religion and state in Israel. I, I would be very happy if we did not have religious parties in Israel. Uh, I, I certainly don't support religious parties that are made up only of men, where women can't even be representatives of the political party in the Knesset, uh, just as I would be opposed to that if it existed in Palestine as well. By the way, the Palestinian election law calls for a mandatory representation of at least 25% women on their political list whenever they will have elections. We don't have a law like that in Israel. So my own personal feeling about what Israel as a Jewish state means is very different from what most Israelis believe. I would be totally happy for us to be an Israeli state where Israeli Jews and Israeli Palestinians who represent 21% of the country are completely equal. I have no problem with us adding symbols to our flag or changing the flag or changing our national anthem. I, I think that we will face that at some time in the future when we are beyond the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and the Palestinian citizens of Israel are no longer suspect of identifying with the enemy. When I go to Israel, when I visit Israel, I see Israelis to very large extent having tattoos all over their body in violation of Jewish laws. I see them driving on the Sabbath and going to the beach in violation of Jewish laws. I see them not following kosher laws. I see them partying on the Sabbath and drinking alcohol, all of it in violation, I think, of Jewish law. So what makes a, a Jewish state a Jewish state if most of its citizens do not respect the Jewish religion? Well, people have different interpretations of what Jewish law is and how Jewish law should be followed. Um, but you cannot neglect the reality that Israel has become more Jewish over the years. This is something sociologically known in conflict zones, that when conflict zones move further away from peace, they tend to become more traditional, more conservative, and more religious. And this is true both in Israel and in Palestine. I live in Jerusalem. I live in a neighborhood that I moved to 34 years ago. It is becoming increasingly ultra-Orthodox. My neighborhood where I live, my secular neighborhood, is no longer a secular neighborhood. All around me are ultra-Orthodox. Jerusalem is 35%. The ultra orthodox and another 20 25 percent of traditional people so jerusalem is maybe not the same as the rest of israel but israel population is becoming more and more religious and even those people the secular people in tel aviv who are partying on on shabbat on the sabbath most of them are believers most of them fast on yom kippur and have a seder on pesach and have different expressions of their jewish culture but if you ask me what identifies the state of israel as jewish I would say more than anything else, the Hebrew language. All right. So uh, why can't we have a, a a Jewish state with a Hebrew language and a Palestinian with Hebrew and Arabic? I know a lot of Palestinians speak Hebrew. All live under the same government in the same country. It's a utopian a picture that you're painting, and I just don't think that we're ready for it. We can't move from October 7th to a one-state solution. It, it, it would be a constant bloodbath here. Yeah, but before October 7, we had uh, October 6, and uh, we had... The reality of October 6 was a reality of 56 years of occupation since the 67 war, and 20 years of siege on the Gaza Strip, and what happened on October 7th is it's because of that, because the reality on October 6 wasn't good either. Israel was not willing to let up control over the Palestinian territories, which they call part of the state of Israel. The expansionist nature of the right-wing messianic government that we have today is trying to create wider provocations in order to force Palestinians from their homes, as they've done in Gaza, and as they're trying to do in Lebanon, and as they would like to do in the West Bank since the beginning of the war. 20 Palestinian communities have been evacuated by violent settlers. 36 new settlements have been established since the beginning of the war last year, October 7th. This is a plan which is in action to take over the whole territory and to force Palestinians from their homes. You want to go from there to a one-state utopia? 
I don't think it's possible. We have a lot of changes that need to be made. Palestinians need to have independence and sovereignty. Israel will never have security if Palestinians don't have freedom, independence, and dignity. Palestinians will have, never have security if Israel doesn't have security. It's a mixed game here. There's no way of moving from this horrible reality to a one-state utopia. Is it is the uh, Jewish state of Israel, is that a problem or is that a solution? For some people, it's a solution. For other people, it's a problem. Um, I, I think that it, it, as someone who wants to live in peace in the region, I think that the neighbors of Israel need to respect the right of the Jewish people for sovereignty. I think that we in Israel need to fight for a democracy and equality for all citizens. You know that you know this, but a lot of people don't know that in our identity cards, it used to say nationality and it said Jewish. There were people who went to the High Court of Israel, the Supreme Court, and asked to write instead of Jewish Israeli. And the High Court of Israel said, no, it's not true. The nationality of the country is Jewish. Of course, for Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel, it used to just say Arab, or maybe even said Muslim, I, I'm, I don't even remember, or Christian. It, but since the inflow of the uh, immigration from the former Soviet Union, when so many Jewish immigrants, Judaism was questioned by the state, they removed that from identity cards, so now it doesn't say it anymore. But it's very difficult. We're going to have to wage a battle here for our nationality to be Israeli, and that includes Jews and includes Palestinian Arabs. Now, you said that the Palestinians have to respect Israel, respect, uh, I, I forgot how you said it. but I'll put it this way. Look, it's really simple. I have my friend, my colleague, Samer, who I work with, once said in front of a Jewish, Jewish audience the following, and I thought it was a brilliant statement. He said, look, we as Muslims, we read the Quran, we know our history. We cannot say that the Jews have not connected to this land. The Jews have always been here for thousands of years. We cannot deny that as Muslims, but we have to remind our Jewish friends that they were never here alone. There were always others in this land, and we are the others today. So this is what we have to realize, that Jews are connected to this land, and Palestinians have been living here for generations. And there's no way of denying it by saying that the Palestinian people is an invented people, as some people have said. They're here. They've been living here on this land for hundreds of years, and they're connected to the land, and their identity is taken from the land as well. Uh, why should the Palestinians respect the um a Jewish state, Zionism, when a Jewish state expelled them from the state of Palestine, Look, when I the Jewish never... state occupied them and, 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 and kept them under apartheid. Why should they respect that? No, I would never ask the Palestinians what Tzipi Livni asked them to do, and that's recognize Israel as a Jewish state. The identity of the state is the matter of the state and not of anyone else. Israel needs to define itself, and we have a struggle in defining who we are. What is important is that the Palestinian people and the, Palest the state of Palestine recognize the state of Israel. This is what international relations is about. We will be two member states in the United Nations. We will be signatories to multiple international conventions. We have to uh, relate to each other with the same rights and obligations as every other state in the world. No state asks another state to recognize it as a certain identity. International relations are based on the recognition of states and their rights and obligations under international law. I said with regard to history, it will take us a long time to forget, and maybe we will never forgive each other for what we have done to each other over the last hundred years. But that does not preclude us turning a new page and starting a new future. Well, I agree. Uh, but the Palestinian in general and the Palestinian leadership do not see Israel as a legitimate country. I, I wouldn't say that's true. I, 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 that's certainly true, perhaps, with regard to Hamas. The PLO, which represents the mainstream nationalist Palestinians, recognized Israel and still support a two-state solution and want to make peace with Israel. It's Israel that's the naysayer today more than the Palestinians. But as I said, we don't have leaders, not in Israel nor in Palestine, who have the capabilities of moving us forward toward peace. They're not simply not legitimate in the eyes of their own people in order to do that. Do you think that the Israelis are interested really in two states or are they interested in basically taking over and expelling the Palestinians from, Look, what we've seen from, from Palestine, research, from the West Bank and Gaza? 
what we've seen from recent research done by a very important new institution at the Hebrew University called Accord, which works in the area of social psychology, is they do polling every month, and they've been doing it since the beginning of the war. And we have seen a, a trend increasing where a majority of Israelis today no longer believe that there is a military solution to this conflict. They don't know what a political solution is, and they don't necessarily support a two-state solution, but they know that there is no military solution. That's an opening to something that we haven't seen in a long time. I, I don't believe that a majority of Israelis are interested in expelling the Palestinians, nor do they believe that they think it's possible, nor do they think it's moral. We as the Jewish people, more than anyone else, should know how immoral it is to even imagine the expelling of another people from their land. But the Israeli people don't have enough confidence in the Palestinians that they're willing to live in peace. Just as the majority of Palestinians don't have confidence that there are Israelis who are willing to live in peace with them. This is part of our problem. A majority of Israelis and a majority of Palestinians will say, I want peace, but they don't. And they have enough reason to justify saying they don't because the behavior of both sides proves it on a daily basis. Does the Israeli government, uh, the Israeli Knesset, the Israeli government assistant, do they trust each other? The Israelis there, amongst is there the Israelis? a trust in the Israeli? No, I, we have a breakdown in our political system, in our democracy, which is fading away. And the quality of our leadership within our parliament, within the Knesset, has scraped the bottom of the barrel. We have never had such a low level of human quality as our representatives today. And we have a breakdown in our system. Our democracy is withering. The legislative branch is virtually irrelevant because it's controlled by the executive, and the executive branch of government wants to do away with the independence of the judiciary. We have a man who's an autocrat who's leading our government, who is a danger to our security and a danger to our democracy. And in a normal democracy, on October 8th, he would have stepped down. There is no justification for Benjamin Netanyahu continuing to be the prime minister of Israel after the failures of himself personally and his government, both with regard to the Palestinian issue, with regard to Hamas in Gaza, with regard to Lebanon and Hezbollah, with regard to Iran, everything. There's, and our economy is crashing today because of Netanyahu and his party politics and supporting uh, a large percentage of the population who refuse to serve in the army when the army needs more people ever than before. This is a, a corrupt system with a diminishing democracy. We're in danger here. Well, was Israel ever a democracy? It did not. It never had a, a, a constitution. No, Britain doesn't have a constitution either. That's not the, the, the basis of whether or not they're a democracy. I think that Israel has always been a challenged democracy, but I think it's lived by the spirit of democracy. It's tried to be a democracy. It was much more democratic in the past than it is today. We're, we're in decline. Well, you say uh, Britain does not have a constitution, but it has a system of transparency uh, where uh, the Israeli government, you yourself said that the Israeli government, the, the legislative body and the executive body is almost the same people, so it cannot have transparency. No, we don't have transparency in government. As I said, our decline, our democracy is in decline and it's challenged and it's threatened. I'm like talked about the United Kingdom. You know, they recently had elections. And you think about their system. On the morning after the elections, they had a new prime minister and a new government. And on that morning, the prime minister who failed in the elections was calling members of parliament to lost their seats to apologize to them. Can you imagine Benjamin Netanyahu apologizing to anyone? No, I cannot. I think that the, 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 the problem that Israel, Ben-Gurion promised to have a constitution. It's in the Declaration of Independence. Right. And it was never that, done. Said, I wouldn't need a constitution. I would love for us to have a constitution, but it depends what that constitution says, because right. we could have a it, bad it, constitution also. Is it possible to have a constitution for a Jewish state? I don't know. It's um, a very big and difficult question. I think it's possible for Israel to be defined as the nation state of the Jewish people and all of its citizens, and for it to have a democracy and a constitution that guarantees equality for all. The the necessary, necessary element for that to happen is for the Israeli-Palestinian conflict to be over. Because as long as 21% of the citizens of Israel are Palestinians and identify with the Palestinian people, they will be viewed by the state as a threat. And they will never receive full equality because of that. Well, the Israeli-Palestinian 
conflict could be over by dismantling the country of Israel. Could well, it not? Certainly it could be. And, and of course, all the Jews here could scatter around the world and there wouldn't be any Israel. But let's be realistic. That's not no, I happen. know, but is it necessary for the Jews to be scattered? Can the Jews and the Palestinians live in peace, in a democracy, without the Jews being scattered, without the Palestinians being scattered? Why is that the only possibility? Why can't... I didn't say it's the only possibility. I said that's a utopian reality that we're not ready for yet. No, I, I know, or... but whether or not the Israelis are ready for it, it could happen. In the because very the, it's, because it's, the Israeli system is crumbling within itself, because yeah, it but it's crumbling. It's crumbling in the wrong direction. It's imploding and it's creating very bad uh, characteristics that that make the situation even worse. The appearance of people like Ben Gvir and Smutrich and these radical racist right wing fanatic messianics are the effect of the uh, d a deteriorating situation, and they would gain more support when Israelis feel that their identity is threatened? Well, it, there is no direction of crumbling. Crumbling is always crumbling down. And whether there, whatever reason you give it, uh, there is a possibility that Israel will crumble within itself and from the outside. But does that necessarily mean um, less security for the Jewish people? In Israel, I don't know how to answer the question. We don't live in a neighborhood where people openly accept each other in a peaceful way. Whether we like it or not, of course we don't like it, we have real enemies. Some of the people in this region really don't want us to exist and, and are ready to take action so that that does happen. So we're, are, we're not they ready enemies, to... are they enemies for a reason, or are they enemies just because they love to have enemies? I, I mean, no, going back to my first question own... is, or one of my questions is, Israel engaged in expulsion of Palestinians in apartheid, in, in, in the occupation. I mean, they have a reason to be enemies. Is Israel dealing with that issue at all? No, of course not. Israel is not dealing with that. But let's also face it that there are enemies here whose basis of being enemies is anti-Semitism, is that we are of a different religion, that they have an extreme, distorted version of Islam that they practice, whether it be the radicals in Hezbollah or radicals in Hamas and Islamic Jihad, or the extremist mullahs in Iran. It's not just hatred of Israel because Israel is a Zionist state that expelled Palestinians and practices apartheid. There are deeper under set, under, under footing reasons why this hatred exists in, in, in the personification of Israeli Jews as pigs and dogs and using all kinds of mythical hadiths from Islam about the need to kill the Jews, not kill the Israelis, kill the Jews. Um, now, I, I don't believe that most criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. I think criticism of Israel is legitimate. But there is anti-Semitism there as well, which is not legitimate. And it exists within those radical Islamic groups especially. Well, Jews and uh, Muslim have lived in peace for hundreds of years. My in-laws came from Iraq, where Jews lived for 3,000 years. And in three years, 3,000 years of Jewish Heritage in Iraq was removed when the state of Israel was founded, and, and Jews in Iraq had to leave. They couldn't stay there anymore. So, when my in law lived in Baghdad, 30% of Baghdad was Jewish. I know that because my mother is from Baghdad, and my father is from Basra. Uh, my mother-in-law is from Basra, and my father-in-law from Baghdad. So maybe we're related. Well, that's what Hanan Ashrawi told me, the, the same thing. She said that she thinks she was uh, Jewish. And, she probably um, was. What? She probably was. As a Christian from the Holy Land, she was probably Jewish before she became Christian. Yeah, so we were uh, contemplating doing a DNA test to see if we are related. Okay. One more thing. You were instrumental in the Gilad Shalit uh, uh, release and uh, the exchange of prisoners that Israel... Um, exchange with the Palestinians. Um, 
any thought about that in relation to what's going on right now? I see you publish a lot of articles about that. Yeah, well, th there needs we have to bring the hostages home. There's 101 hostages still in Gaza. We don't know how many of them are alive. We don't know what their condition is. We know nothing about them. What we do know is that 101 hostages remain in Gaza for more than a year now. It's unimaginable the pain and suffering that those who are alive are going through, and maybe most of them won't come back alive. I think that there is no way of bringing them home without an agreement with Hamas. An agreement with Hamas has to include the release of all the hostages. It has to include the end of the war and Israeli withdrawal from Gaza. But it also has to include the recognition by Hamas that they cannot continue to govern Gaza. From my understanding, my talks with Hamas, they recognize that. and They're ready for a civilian, professional, technocratic government to be appointed to rule the Gaza Strip. It's not clear what they are planning to do with their own future and how they plan to develop themselves. I hope that they will develop into a legitimate political party and leave um, the armed struggle behind. But this is something that we need to see. I'm pushing for, as hard as I can, for a negotiated deal. I've spoken to Hamas leaders. I've communicated this with the White House, with the Qataris, the Egyptians, the Israeli prime minister, the Israeli negotiators. It's been supported by Israeli generals, and it's been on television and radio and newspapers all around the world. I am traveling in the region and meeting people and hopefully meeting with Hamas people directly, hopefully in the coming couple of weeks. And because we don't know what the situation is following the killing of Yahya Sinwar, the leader of Hamas in Gaza, we don't know if Hamas can enforce an agreement in Gaza. We don't know if Hamas still supports making an agreement with Israel at this time. So all this needs to be evaluated. Secretary Blinken was just here. He's in the region. And the Americans are finally, I think, taking this more seriously. I think to remind everyone, President Biden needs to consider whether or not his legacy is going to be the Gaza war president or the president who ended the war in Gaza and brought home the hostages. No one is going to remember President Biden in the future because of the infrastructure bill. It's going to be the war in Gaza and what he does in terms of pressuring Israel to end it or not pressuring Israel to end it. I think Blinken was here to tell the Israelis to limit their retaliatory attack against Iran and not to bring an escalation in the region and to figure out how it's going to end the war in Lebanon and end the war in Gaza. And this is what the Americans need to be doing now. Now, how do you talk with Hamas? Uh, literally on the phone? On the phone, on Telegram and Signal. They don't use WhatsApp anymore. They use Telegram or Signal and, of course, phone calls. And how do you know that you are dealing with the people that have possession or have the ability to release the hostages? Well, today we don't know. We don't know if the people, the people that I'm talking to are all part of the Hamas leadership, the Politburo, outside of Gaza. They're mostly in Doha, in Qatar. In, and, and we don't, one of the things that we need to verify is that if they do make an agreement, they can enforce it in Gaza. One of the tests is going to have to be that there will be a three to five day ceasefire by Israel, a total ceasefire, during which time Hamas is going to have to produce a list of names of all the hostages and what their condition is, who's alive and who's dead. And this has to be a test that has to be given to Hamas before Israel withdraws from Gaza. We need to know that whoever is going to implement the deal on the Hamas side has the ability to do it. I see. So, so there is a testing mechanism. There will have to be, whether it's the one that I just said or something else. There will have to be some mechanism to verify that Hamas and Gaza can, ver can implement the deal. I see. Have you met with Netanyahu? Never. Why not? He's not interested in talking to me. I have a thank you letter from him two feet away from me on my wall for the work that I did in bringing Gilad Shalit home. But I was supposed to meet him right after Shalit came home, and, and uh, he never agreed to the meeting. Well, have you tried to meet him now and, and talk to him? I have about... no reason to talk to him. Uh, I, I talked to the negotiators who are empowered by him or not empowered by him, as it so be. They don't really have a mandate to do the job. I don't know why they've stayed in the job for so long. Um, I don't see any value for me to talk to Natino. I've talked to members of his government, uh, also not very productive. Um, we need pressure on Netanyahu from the American side. Uh, the pressure from within Israel is not going to happen. Does he is he basically playing us? For sure, he's a narcissist who only wants to stay in power. So all of these negotiations that are going on with uh, supposedly going on in Egypt, in Qatar, or the American. It's just a show. Yeah, m most of the past year, the deal has been blocked by Netanyahu. One of his top negotiators told me repeatedly, the prime minister doesn't want to end the war. When they all know that the condition for making a deal with Hamas and bringing home the hostages is ending the war. 
Nothing else just want to end the war. So for how long will this war go on? Either until the Americans force it to end, or we have so many dead Israelis, soldiers coming home dead all the time that the people of Israel will say no more. Could the Americans force Netanyahu to stop sure. the war? The Americans have enormous leverage over Israel. Israel is so dependent on the United States more than ever before. So when will they uh, force Israel to, to end the war? Yes, what what condition Biden. would they? I don't know. I've been pushing for this for a long time. I'm talking now about Biden's legacy and hoping that will have some impact on him. All right. All right, Gershon, thank you so much. I enjoyed the conversation with you. And um, hopefully, um, you know, I don't, I, uh, uh, hopefully you will see you again, you know, maybe in one of our simulations. I know that you are not that interested in it. You don't think it's realistic. No, no, no. I think, I think that what you're doing, Joseph, is really valuable. And I think bringing more and more people into it is important for people to be exposed to new thinking and new ideas and new possibilities. I support you wholeheartedly. I think what you're doing is, is really important work, and I encourage you to continue it. Will you come to one of our simulations? I will come to one of your simulations again after the war, when, when the hostages are all home. I'm focused 24-7 on the issue of ending the war on okay. the hostages. All right. Well, uh, um, I know that it's a holiday uh, coming up. and Not uh, much of a holiday. This is when it happened last year on Sibkhat Torah. Yeah. And I know that you, your family is waiting for you. So thank you so much. And uh, too. I appreciate your time. Thanks, Joseph. hopefully we'll sure. see you again. Be well. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you. Bye-bye.